Okay, so we'll start this. Um, and we left the rip in space time. So we'll pick up with that and talk about um, non Newtonian gravity. So, in a sense, you could think about this as uh, everything that I have taught you or you've learned about gravity so far is wrong. So it turns out to be true. Newton perpetrated this great fraud on us. Uh, I will remove this because it's no longer true as of last September. And then a little bit about black holes. So the universe is full of these crazy, perfect, silent killing machines. So this is a pretty... What? Ah, uh, this. So tax money is no longer being wasted on absurd machines. They work. So we've detected black holes in spiraling for LIGO, yeah. I'm just, I missed that part of the slide. So uh, it's kind of true about LISA, but they cut the funding for LISA, the space interferometer. Yeah, for years I had this slide, and I was like, someday, 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 in your lifetime, and then it finally happened. Okay, so why the hate on Newton's law of gravity? So this has been basically like our key to understanding all sorts of stuff about the cosmos. So this idea that you have you know, two things with mass, and they're separated by a distance, and they put an attractive force on each other proportional to the product of the masses over the square of the distance. And this tells you this kind of fun and interesting arcane stuff, like what's the mass of Saturn? What's the mass of Jupiter? We don't have to go there and weigh it. And in fact, we'll keep using it. We actually weighed the mass of the center of the galaxy if you did the extra credit and got this weird dark matter conundrum. And we'll eventually use it to detect exoplanets and without a single modification. So it works for nice orbits. It works for even goofy things like the Trojan asteroids. Um, why are we suddenly turning on Newton's law of gravity? And it turns out for kind of at first an aesthetic reason, but then that predicts all sorts of stuff that was observed in the 20th century. So this is the way that we'll kind of approach it is, um, you know, I'm on the moon and I drop a hammer and a feather, so there's basically no atmosphere, no air resistance. Which one hits first? Drop them at the same time. same time, because there is this neat trick where the force got bigger with the mass of the object being pulled, but then the acceleration gets smaller with the, you know, as the mass of the thing getting pulled increases, and they cancel out, and it turns out that the acceleration on the moon depends on this Newton's constant thingy, the moon's mass, and the distance you are from the center of the moon. Likewise, the acceleration of a planet around our star only depends on the mass of the star and the distance from the star. This is really Kepler's third law is that you don't care about the thing that's orbiting. It's just distance has something to do with the period of the planet. Not You, know, you can't change Kepler's third law if you like take a scoop out of Saturn or whatever. So it turns out that the mass of the thing being pulled isn't important. And maybe I could ask this like this is... Uh, what if I were to drop a very heavy hammer, a pretty light feather, and then I also dropped a massless photon, which is to say a packet of light? So if mass doesn't matter, does no mass matter? And you can ask me how I'm dropping a packet of light, and I'll tell you, I just like put it in between two mirrors so it can't fly off. I just you know, let a laser beam go. And would the laser beam drop and fall to the surface of the moon, or would it just bounce back and forth forever and ever? Because it's kind of ambiguous, right? You have like zero over zero. So how many people think the light would fall and hit the center of, you know, hit the surface of the moon? A couple of brave people. How many people think the massless light would just bounce back and forth in between the mirrors forever and ever and ever? This is this is unclear, right? And it's unclear because Newton formulated his laws in terms of masses. And it seems like they break when we start talking about things that have no mass. Um, so instead of dropping it, we'll talk about it in the opposite way, because we're not going to go to black holes and drop stuff in quite yet. The way that it was phrased in the context of black holes for the first time was actually not dropping stuff from rest and seeing that they all speed up at the same rate. It was actually take something, and I throw it up, and it comes back down. Take something, throw it up in the atmosphere, throw it up in the air, comes back down. There's an end to that, and you can predict that if 
you were to take something and throw it at 14 kilometers per second from the surface of Earth, you would have enough energy to get all the way away from the gravitational pull of Earth. So you'd throw this thing out, and it would go to the edge of the cosmos. And that also doesn't depend on the mass of the thing throwing. So in the same way that the you know things fall at the same rate, if I throw them at some and the same, the escape velocity, the same initial speed, they would all totally escape Earth's gravity. For Earth, that's 14 kilometers per second. It's very fast. That's why you know, you've know you never thrown anything and never seen it come back. Um, maybe we could do it with the supernova explosion toy. Uh, for the moon, it depends on the moon's mass. So that's 2.2 kilometers per second. So you're not going to jump off the surface of the moon. And again, it doesn't depend on the thing that you're throwing. It's the escape velocity for all things. So the space shuttle gets up to, hopefully this doesn't happen, but if the space shuttle got up to 14 kilometers per second, those astronauts would be gone. So it just depends on the mass of the thingy. And people knew that a very long time ago. And they also knew the speed of light, or that light had a finite speed through you know, some pretty primitive experiments. It gave the wrong number, but it gave a number. And in 1783, an English geologist, this is how these people are described, but basically everybody back then was, they were just like scientists. You know, nobody really, I don't know, to kind of name you or pigeonhole you after your greatest achievement. But this English geologist named John Mitchell um, said, well, if the escape velocity increases with the mass, what if I had this thing that was so massive that the escape velocity was bigger than the speed of light? And he wasn't talking about ripping holes in space-time. He was just talking about, wouldn't it be cool if there was a dark star out there? So this, like, the star is so massive that the light just gets sucked back onto it? Or what if gravity doesn't affect light? Would we actually have a dark star, and would the light escape? So, you know... To be fair, this isn't a picture of a dark star, and this isn't a picture of John Mitchell. I just figured anybody in a powdered wig would do. But this is an old idea is the point, is that if you can make something that had the escape velocity just by increasing its mass, is the speed of light, and people were talking about this in you know, 1783 is the first idea. So people actually tried to go out and look and see if there were dark stars. How would you try to determine there was a dark star out there if you were like a 18th, 19th century astronomer. Yes, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a transit, but if you see something orbiting a patch of empty light, and stop me if this sounds familiar, so if we were to just blot this out, and 50% of stars occur in binaries, so if I just saw the star like orbiting nothing, I would be like, wow, there's this empty patch in the sky. So people actually made a, you know, they were aware of this, and weirdly it turns out that's the way that you see dark stars, a.k.a. black holes. And, you know, back in the 18th century, people were trying to figure this out. And it answers this question of, you know, does gravity affect light? You know, pretty, pretty soon after that, people came to consensus that it probably should for other reasons, energy reasons. But it's still, you know, does gravity affect light and how so? Okay, so technology is not good enough to see these dark stars at that time. Uh, 1905 rolls around, completely different um, branch of science. People are talking about why light seems to be uh, moving at the speed of light in every single frame. So if you have a laser pointer and I shine it at you, it gets to you at the speed of light. If I'm traveling on something going at half the speed of light and I shine a laser pointer at you, it doesn't hit you at 1.5 times the speed of light. Light travels at the speed of light. It doesn't travel at 1.5 times the speed of light. It's the speed of light, um, which is weird, right? And Einstein basically used this fact to come up with the special theory of relativity that says in order for the speed of light to be constant, the things that have to be not constant are what constitutes a meter stick. So if I'm moving faster, maybe what I seem to think is a meter stick, you don't think is a meter. And time actually is not constant either. So events aren't universally simultaneous. And if I'm moving really fast, a clock would appear to be moving slower in your frame versus my frame. So Han Solo's wristwatch goes much more slowly than mine does when he pops into you know, near hyperspace. There's no such thing as hyperspace. So breaking the rules of relativity. Um, so basically, Einstein, as well as a couple other papers, a very good year for him, dethroned the idea of there being absolute time 
absolute distances. So there's no such thing as a meter stick. You cannot simultaneously synchronize all the clocks in the world. Um, explaining the constancy of the speed of light, that wasn't enough. He came after Newton, and he had an issue with Newton's law of gravity, which is kind of sad because it's so useful to us. But it was kind of an aesthetic uh, complaint at first. And it goes as follows, is that, you know, so here's like Halley's Comet, and it's orbiting the sun. And let me grab the sun and wiggle it. So what I should see if I'm standing out here, Halley's Comet, at this really far edge of its orbit, after about you know 10 hours or so, the speed of light travel time, I would see the sun wiggle. So because light takes some finite amount of time to travel from here to here, sun wiggles, sometime later I see the sun wiggle. What Newton's law of gravity says right now, and um, you know, maybe you realized it felt a little bit weird while you were computing this, is that everything seems to be instantaneous. So even though Halley's Comet takes you know, some amount of time, a few hours to see the sun wiggle, Halley's Comet, when it's figuring out what its orbit is, is still saying, well, OK, I know g. I'm going to measure the sun's mass. I'm going to take my mass. I'm going to multiply them together. I'm going to take the instantaneous distance from me to the sun, and then I'm going to divide by that thing squared. So as the sun wiggles, what this piece of matter out here is doing is instantaneously taking its position. This isn't its position you know, at the speed of light time travel back. This is its instantaneous position in calculating this with its pocket calculator. And Einstein's objection was that speed of light should travel at some finite, does travel at some finite um, speed. Therefore, so should gravitational radiation. And this law doesn't do that. It says this is all instant. The instantaneous position, let's say it blows up the instantaneous mass. So there's something that violates relativity in this law as it stands. Okay. So the solution is philosophically and conceptually very elegant. The math is terrible. And Einstein's idea was that, well, in fact, this isn't like a force. There's no such thing as gravitational force. So we actually get to dodge this problem of something with no mass feel no force. What gravity really is, it's kind of a warpage of this now non-constant uh, field of space and time. And if something has a lot of mass, what it's really doing is it's warping all of the space around it in the way that if you were to stand on a trampoline, the trampoline would bow under your weight and things would appear to be pulled in. And you could imagine that you're standing on a trampoline and somebody rolls a ball past you and the ball would start actually orbiting, right? So up to the you know, loss of energy to friction is that this is because you're bowing the, you know, the fabric on which you're standing. Imagine that, but all of space. And the more mass you have, the more you're warping space-time. And now, because this is kind of a fabric, and um, you know, or a fluid is another way of thinking about it, if I were to grab this 10 kilogram ball and wiggle it, now what happens is the perturbations in space-time and the way that this thing bows and sags under the influence of gravity will actually move out. And the speed at which the ripples would move out is the speed of light. So it turns out they're the same speed. So this is the idea behind general relativity. It's not like these particles all have pocket calculators and they're instantly plugging in masses and distances, instantaneous distances. What's happening is things with more mass warp space-time more. If I grab one and I shake it, the gravitational influence takes speed of light time to move out and influence the other thing. And it's kind of ripply. So that's the big idea. Um, questions about that? It's so sensible, you know, um, but the math is so evil. OK, the other thing that this predicts is that after you get to some critical density, you actually warp space-time so much that light cannot escape wherever you're in. And it predicts that once you get to that critical density, in fact, everything collapses in on itself. So you actually predict these singularities, AKA black holes. Um, so not dark stars that just have so much mass that light can't get off of them. This, once this process starts, you just go. So there are singularities in space-time. And people didn't think they were real, but they were there. So.
Yeah, so the what does this thing mean and what is this picture? Yeah, so we'll get into this in a second. These are cartoons to try to map some like two-dimensional um, intuition onto what's fundamentally like a 3D thing. So this is an analogy. If instead of three-dimensional space, space was 2D and I could just like really seriously talk about putting you know cannonballs on um, on trampolines and deforming the trampoline. The so-called event horizon is the distance that once you get beyond that, you're never going to get back out. So imagine that you're a grasshopper on a trampoline and you can only jump so high. At some point, if I start pressing the trampoline down, it's going to be so depressed that the poor little grasshopper can't make it out and the grasshopper is stuck in this forever. So that's kind of what the event horizon is, but it's for light. This is a 2D depiction to kind of like cartoonify and explain what's going on. But really what would happen is this would be in 3D. So there'd be like a spherical shell. And once you get within that spherical shell, you're just never coming back out again. So yeah, so the event horizon would be the point of no return for light, which is the fastest that anything can go. Yeah. Yeah, the event horizon for real would be a 2D surface in 3D. So it would be like, imagine this shell, like this black shell with really warped light around it. And I can put my hands around it, but once my finger goes beyond the event horizon, it or light or anything else would not come back. So again, this is the you know kind of 2D cartoon of what's going on. So, yeah. yeah, so the... I think that question kind of gets to what people mean when they talk about a black hole. So you can hang out near a black hole. And if I replace the sun with a black hole that was the mass of the sun, in fact, it wouldn't be the worst thing ever, aside from the fact that we wouldn't get any light, is that our Earth's orbit wouldn't change. So we would just be around a black hole. Once you get to the event horizon, or past the event horizon, then you're never coming out. So there's this kind of Disney picture of black holes where there are these like evil sucking vacuums in space. But if I have a black hole that's the mass of the sun, it just acts like something that's the mass of the sun. So there's, you know, there's nothing intrinsically evil about that or anything. You know, and it doesn't do anything until, until I start messing with the event horizon. And once I put something into that gravity well or past that event horizon, it's just never coming out. And odds are the gravity near the event horizon also has some you know, practically speaking, evil tidal forces and things like that that I would have to worry about. But, you know, the spitting stuff out, um, you can have white hole solutions to Einstein's theory of general relativity. Nobody's ever seen a white hole. Um, the stuff that it can spit out is Hawking radiation, which would evaporate a black hole, you know, like 10 times the age of the universe or something. So that's even not really that evil. But there are questions. Okay, so this was predicted. It was, you know, just because equations have a solution doesn't mean it has to exist. So people were like, how interesting, and then just kept going on. Um, I'll leave this here because we don't have enough time to really talk about general relativity in, like, complete detail. But you could think about the transition from Newton's conception of the universe, which is, you think about it as, like, a stage, right? So all of this stuff is happening on this perfectly level stage, and there's a clock on either end of the stage, and those clocks could be synchronized. So there's a rod and a clock at every point in space, and they would all potentially agree. Is special relativity says if you're moving faster, what happens is these clocks actually run at different rates, and the rods contract. And then the general relativistic theory says that that actually also happens in the presence of matter. So this, you know, what used to be a perfect... Newtonian, everything at right angles, all the clocks run at the same rate. Um, you know, way of accounting for stuff in the universe actually um, no longer works in the presence of mass. And so this clock, because it's closer to Earth, would run more slowly than that clock. So one part in 10 to the you know, 
12 orders of magnitude or something ridiculously small, so you don't notice this. Humans don't on a daily basis. I will say that you do need to account for this to get very good GPS precision. So GPS um, satellites actually do need to account for general relativistic effects, the fact that the Earth is spinning primarily. But So these would be stretched, and that would run more slowly. So if you live on the first floor of your apartment and your friend uh, is bragging because they live in the penthouse suite or whatever, they're going to die faster because their personal time is running faster. Not by a lot, but it's a, it's a real thing. Yeah. Just thought I saw a hand. Okay. Um, if this link still works, I forgot to check this one. Um, uh, hatefully, I will admit that Brian Green actually does a really good job of explaining this stuff in this clip. So if you want to learn a little bit more about general relativity and the space-time fabric idea and see some really good demos, I would totally, I would watch this and recommend it. Um, the link's busted. I'll find another version of it. But for our purposes, um, mass and energy curve space is really important, and time is not absolute, and these relative, uh, sorry, these singularities exist, which solves a problem. So we had a lower limit on our initial mass function, which was just, this isn't a limit on shreds of gas, this is a limit on fusion. So things be below this really aren't fusing that much. And they're, you know, if they're bright, they're bright in infrared, so we don't see them, they're out there, these are brown dwarfs. What's the upper limit? So why couldn't I have like a 500 solar mass star? You know, really it wouldn't live for a very long time, but so what? I want it. There are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. I should see one like super crazy star, right? Like an O++ or something. And the answer to that is that the limit on this side of the initial mass function is basically if you get a cloud of gas that's going to turn into, would have turned into a 200 or 300 solar mass star, it's do not report to fusion, do not pass go, just report directly to black hole. And you just immediately rip a hole in space time. So that's the upper limit on this. So that has some, you know, there's some indirect evidence that these things were out there. So the second thing that um, GR did was it actually gave this very strong prediction, not only that so we're not talking about masses anymore, like with Newton's law of gravity. We're talking about you know the, fundam the fundamental fabric of space itself is warped. So you're now walking along like kind of a warped floor. And so maybe you veer left and right. And this says that absolutely gravity affects light. And it tells you exactly how much it should. And what people could theoretically do is you know, imagine that there's some light coming from the star. And then it gets really close to a big gravity well, like our sun, which is very close, and the light would be bent and perturbed by its you know, passage really close to this space-time curving matter. This is a huge exaggeration. So this is the best we're going to do in our local neighborhood because this is the heaviest, closest thing. Um, what would be the problem of trying to do this experiment of basically what you do is you look at a field of stars when the sun isn't in the way, and then the sun gets in front of the field of stars, and you'd expect them to warp a little bit because of the gravitational influence. Why is this a hard thing to do in practice? Same reason nobody knows what their real astronomical sign is. So this experiment would be basically look at a field of stars when the sun's really far away. And then as the sun comes through, the sun would bend the sunlight, and you would see the stars kind of warp a little bit when they're really close to the sun. Well, so when somebody says, for instance, like, I'm an Aries, I take their word for it. Because when the sun's in Aries, I don't see the constellation Aries and then the sun right in the middle of it, right? Sun's really, really, really bright, so you don't see this like directly. So this is a problem. So if you want to do this experiment, what do you have to do? Actually, You've got to wait for some celestial event. Solar eclipse. So in 1919, uh, a couple of years actually after the theory of GR was published, people spread themselves all over the globe. This is actually kind of nice because scientists from you know, all of the nations that were fighting in the First World War, and they're like, screw this, let's just do some science. So telescopes all over the globe, 
uh, Southern Africa, New Zealand, you know, Australia, uh, Europe, US, they waited for this. And the moon covered the sun. It was a nice non-annular solar eclipse. And these were the close stars. And the stars' positions shifted in accord with the predictions of general relativity. So it absolutely worked. And very shortly afterwards, this theory was confirmed. Um, by modern standards, the data was not like super conclusive. But our understanding of statistics has advanced a little bit since then. But this is really true. So, some, uh, so light is affected by gravity, absolutely. And we have much better ways of doing this now. So um, we'll pick up with this on Friday. But this is a modern version of that. So this is so-called Einstein's cross. So there's a big thing in the middle, like a, a galaxy. And then the claim is that these four things are identical. And what's happening is there's a close, close, quote unquote, really massive object. And a really far object, the light's coming off the really far object. Gravity bends it, like the stars that are close to our sun. And this person, who's not drawn to scale, actually sees multiple images, repeated images of the same thing. What would convince you that this is actually four repeated images of the same thing and not just like some really lucky congruence of light? Or maybe it's one thing with a funny shape. How would you know that this is, this is what's going on? So luminosity equal among all of them, that would be helpful. What would be kind of like a smoking gun that this is actually a repeated image of the exact same thing? I think about fingerprints of things. Exactly. And if you're ever stumped as an astronomer, like you don't know what to do, it's like your knee-jerk reaction, take a spectra, I guess. Um, so the spectra of that, 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 and that completely agree with each other, identical spectra. So the types of light that it's emitting. And then that has a different spectra. So that is this story. So that's so-called Einstein's cross. And it's a very distinct gravitational lens. So the end of the story that we started is absolutely gravity bends light, gravity affects light. And it does it not by reaching out and pulling light with Newton's, you know, Newton's law of force, because it's got no mass. It does it by warping all of the space in between it. Um, so we'll pick up with. Um, black holes on Friday. But I will say that you know we actually do need this. So there's um, uh, gravitational radiation correction in GPS satellites. And in fact, Mercury's orbit wobbles a little bit. There was an old theory that there was a planet, believe it or not, called Vulcan that was doing this. But it's actually gravitational, uh, sorry, general relativistic effect perturbing Mercury's orbit. So it wins. And we'll pick up with that on uh, Friday. Bring questions on um, exercise seven, definitely.